so that's a version of a trapezoid. What else? Like, what else can look like a trapezoid? How about this kind? Is that a trapezoid? Yeah. Remember that the bases, we call the two parallel lines bases. Even if it's like this, if it's oriented, maybe standing up like that, <clears throat> the two parallel sides are still called bases. Okay, so that's important. Because <clears throat> it talks about these base angles, so we need to know what bases are. All right. Uh, what's a parallelogram? Hmm? Okay. So a parallelogram is two sets of parallel sides. So maybe something like that. All right, so two pairs of opposite sides are both parallel. Remember the symbol for parallel is arrows? So that's a parallelogram. So rectangles are parallelograms. Squares are parallelograms. Rhombuses are parallelograms. All of those. And then things like this that's not subclassified. <clears throat> so basically it's asking to compare this trapezoid with a parallelogram. And you have two options on how you can do this. One, you could... I'll just describe it. Actually, I'll, I'll write it. You could do this. So the area of a trapezoid minus the area of a parallelogram. And this would be all symbolic, not numbers. Uh, because if you look at our answer choices, they all have some kind of variable in them. In this case, A. Okay? So symbolic manipulation or what we call literal equations. So setting up the area formula for each shape and then just subtracting one from the other. But in order to do that, I mean, we could check check this. Does it tell you the area of a, of a trapezoid? Yeah. Or a parallel, right? So in order to do it that way, you'd have to know your formulas for area of a trapezoid and parallel. How many of you know that? Okay, it's probably good to know um, I'm going to hand out a sheet telling, I'll have this on there, but also it'll be a front back page with all the stuff you need to know by memory, okay? Front back page, there's quite a bit there. Okay, so I guess if you don't know that and you couldn't fill out formulas, then this is not an option for you. But just for now, I want you to write this down in your notebook, please. So the area of a trapezoid, I'm going to just subscript it, area of a trapezoid is one half base one plus base two times the height. Trapezoid. Okay, remember bases. I better write that, I just thought of that. base 1 plus <clears throat> base 2 times the height. Bases are those parallel sides. doesn't have to be on the bottom. It's parallel sides. Okay? And then area of a parallelogram. Is base times height. <clears throat> this one probably deserves a little picture. So the height is straight from one side to another. So you don't follow the diagonal, in other words. What are you doing right now? Are you writing it? Write it. Just so you have it somewhere where you could study it before this test. Okay. This way is totally fine. You can do it. It's <clears throat> a little bit involved with the symbolic. And by symbolic, I mean with variables in the, in the equations, because we don't have enough information to get a single number. But it works.
the height of a trapezoid is also just the distance between the two bases, okay? Base one, base two. Do those ring a bell from geometry at all? I don't know if you got the one for parallelogram, but you for sure should have gotten the one for trapezoid in geometry class. All right. The other way to do this is to make this line over there, or draw that line over there. How long is it? So I just moved that one over there. How long is it? How long is it? How long is that line? It's A, right? It's the same as the other side. So what's the difference between the area of this trapezoid and the area of this parallelogram? Describe it. I'm not asking for an actual number. I'm asking a description. What did I remove from the trapezoid by making it a parallelogram? Well, we can't eyeball. It could be one fourth, but none of our choices say a fourth. Yeah, it's this triangle right here, right? So that amount of area is what's different between the trapezoid and the parallelogram with the same measurements, right? So this parallelogram has, it says a parallelogram with side lengths A and B, there's that parallelogram. The trapezoid, base B and side A, shown. This triangle is what's different. So how do you find the area of that triangle? You guys remember that? It is on here. Area of a triangle is on your reference sheet. So one half base times height. Um, what is considered the height of a triangle? Is it A? No. So instead, what is it? Yeah, I don't need that. It's this distance here. Okay. How tall is that blue line? Well, 120 is the measure of that top angle, not a length of a side. Okay, how long is that top line, or that blue line? 60 is an angle, it's not a side length. All right, here's what I want you to do. If you haven't, please draw this picture into your notebook. Look at split. Um, guys, this is one of the harder kind of problems you're going to come across on SAT. And I don't want you to just skip it. Okay? So again, just draw that second line over here to make a parallelogram with side lengths of A. And we need to find the area of the triangle. Okay, so here's what I would do. That, that area of that triangle is the positive difference between the trapezoid and the parallelogram. In other words, <clears throat> if I take this off and ignore it, what I have left is the parallelogram. Okay, so that area is what we're looking for. <clears throat> so maybe go draw the triangle separately so that you can work on it and not worry about the trapezoid for a moment. Well, if I draw this line, it's called an altitude and it makes a right angle. So we now have two of the same triangle, <coughs> excuse me, inside of the triangle. And it happens to be a special right triangle. Does that ring a bell from geometry? Special right triangles. Okay, and here's what's cool. They actually do give you that on your reference sheet. So which one of these is it? Is it the 45-45 or the 30-60-90? It's the 60 one, 30-60, right? So maybe add 30 in there. 
Okay, back to the formula. Which one of these lengths do we know? I don't, okay, we're not worried about angles. I'm saying lengths. Which, in our picture, which of these do we actually know? Like, I need to label it on here. It's A. A is there, right? So, in this triangle, I know A to be, what is the, the name of that line? It's called the, hi, yeah, good job, the hypotenuse. So, in this picture, which one of these is it? Is it 2x, x, or x root 3? It's 2x, okay? <clears throat> so, basically, that little map or that reference tells you that this is half, this short side is half of that length. So what would I label this short side? A over 2, right? It's half of the hypotenuse. And then it tells us the medium side. So now we're looking here. We have written on our picture at A over 2. So what do I do to get this medium length? That's what we need to find this area. Right there. What do we do with the short side to get the medium side? Just multiply it by root 3, right? That's all it says. If the short side is x, this is x times root 3. Our short side is a over 2, so this is a over 2 times root 3. Okay, that's the height of our triangle. You with me? And this is all in a minute and a half, if you're keeping track of time. Uh, but this is why you would want to make some problems faster so you could have extra time. Okay, now we need the area of the triangle, which we saw on that same sheet. It was one-half base times height. So we just found the height. The height is A over 3, excuse me, A over 2 times root 3. How about the base? How long is the base? The base is this bottom line. That's just for this piece right here. So how, about, how long is the whole thing? If this is A over 2, how long is that side? So how long is the whole thing? We're adding. That's not how we add fractions. What's a half of A plus another half of A? It's just A, right? So the base is A, and then we have this half here out front. So all I did was fill in, okay, base is A, height is A root 3 over 2, the half is part of the formula. Now we just need to clean this up a bit. So I see A squared. I see root 3, and I have a 4, right? 2 times 2 on the bottom is 4. So root 3a squared over 4. Everybody follow where that came from? That is choice B. Okay? So, you guys, how many layers are in that problem? A whole bunch, right? We gotta know the difference, like the relationship rather, between a parallelogram and a trapezoid. To do that, you have to know what a parallelogram is in the first place. <clears throat> and that just gets you the picture. From there, you gotta know, <clears throat> excuse me, that to, to go look for or know the area of a triangle formula, you gotta know that that creates a special right triangle and know the relationship between the three side lengths of a special right triangle, the 30, 60, 90. And even the little things like adding fractions here, multiplying fractions here, knowing that a times a is a squared, there's a lot, right? I don't know, 10 or 12 different layers of concepts in that problem, maybe 8 to 10. So you get to this kind of problem, what do you do? What did you say? Try, good. Oh, you said cry. Close enough. Close enough. Like, try while you're crying. Yes. You have a 25% chance of getting it right. Should you leave it blank? Yes. Yeah. Mm. No. There we go.
<laughs> All right, let's look at our choices beforehand and see if there's anything you could logically eliminate. Okay? You look at this problem and you're, you know, maybe you remember what a trapezoid looks like. Maybe you remember what a parallelogram looks like. Is there anything that you could isolate or get rid of <coughs> as a nonsense answer? How many of you feel like you could have at least gotten to that, that picture, just making this a parallelogram? Okay, so let's start from there. Like, you couldn't even do that. Don't leave it blank, okay? Like Kyler said, you at least have a 25% chance of getting it right. Based on our work, what would you pick? If you're blind guessing, what letter should you pick? A? Okay. Statistically, if we want to go that route, they do try to write these tests year by year to where each answer has a, about a fourth chance of being chosen. But a lot of our problems we've done in here, we've seen that B is a common answer. And I'm not telling you that's always true, but in this case, if you happen to say, hey, I have no clue, I'm just going to guess B, you would actually have gotten it, right? Because we've seen B be the correct answer quite a few times. I'm not saying that's going to be true always, but keep it in mind. If it's an absolutely blind guess, I would probably pick B or C myself if I was taking the test. Big idea, do not leave it blank. I think you should give it a little bit of time to try. Should you spend five minutes just racking your brain on this? Absolutely not, right? In fact, save it to the end. If you get to a question where you are completely lost, is there going to be like an option to flag it? Yeah. Um, flag it, like mark it. Yeah. Come back at the end. Do not waste time on it, okay? Get your points on the ones you know how to do. Cool. Um, I don't remember if I mentioned this, but on Tuesday we're having the mock test next week. So you'll go to first period. Tuesday is a red day next week. You'll go to first period. And then we're going to do two and a half, two hours and 40 minutes and actually take the SAT test, um, run through the whole timing, the computer stuff, all of it. You'll have a testing ticket. It will be pretty close to the real deal. So you'll be able to play around with the what software. Are, your... are you taking it? Okay. What are you asking me that? I don't know. If you're not, if you're a senior. Is there still classes after the SAT? Yeah. What he said this morning in the meeting is if you don't take it, you'll just sit in the cafeteria. I will let it <laughs> like if you're an opt-out person. Oh. So what if I'm too old? No But do you have a first period class? Then I just wouldn't come until you actually lunch. Because we do first period, test, test, test till lunch, and then three, five, seven. What is the actual SAT? Sixteen. So and the seventeenth? Seventeenth is PSAT and, and CMAT. So I don't have to come for either of these days. Right. Lucky All right. Good job. We're trying to match these functions to the following. 2 to the x, 2 to the x plus 1, which would just be shifted which way? Less 1. Uh, 2 to the x minus 1, which way would that shift? To the right. 1. Uh, D is 2 to the x, and then plus 2 at the end, where would that go? Up to 2 to the x minus 2 would be down 2. And then we have 3 to the x. So this first one, it looks pretty normal. How do we know which, like, it's not shifted at all because the y-intercept is 1. So it's not translated left, right, up, or down. How do we know if it's 2 to the x or 3 to the x, though? Well, actually, those are not the same parent function, so it's not actually a stretch. So how can we tell? Well, here's how. Plug in 1. On here, if I plug in 1, I get 3. Right? I go hit the graph, I hit 3. 
If I plug in 1 for 2 to the 1, I don't get 3, I get 2. If I plug in 1 for 3 to the x, I do get 3. Okay, so that first one is f, it's 3 to the x. Don't forget that you can always plug points to check these. Okay, this one looks shifted, doesn't it? My y-intercept is now at 2. And so we kind of need to ask, is that a stretch or a translation up? Which one do you think? Well, it is moved up. So this is 2x, 2 to the x plus 2, whichever letter that is. Okay. Next one. So we have normal y-intercept, normal asymptote. Hold on, I might have said that wrong on this one. Yeah, that, I said that wrong. I said 2 to the x plus 2. This is shifted left. Because why? How do we know? It's got the same asymptote. The asymptote didn't, in, didn't go up. Uh, so let me tell you what that looks like, what I mean by that. If this had been um, 2 to the x plus 2, our new asymptote would have to be there, and then it would have to go up from there. But since the asymptote stayed the same, it must have shifted left, so this is 2 to the x plus 2 in there. That was not very clear the first time, because I said it wrong. Good? All right. Um, back to that. Okay, 111. One eleven, again, plug in, it, everything looks kind of non-translated, non-stretched, so plug in 1 and we get 2, that's just 2 to the x, parent function. 112, this one looks different because our y-intercept is different, so our y-intercept looks like it's at a half, so how do we get a y-intercept like that? To the right. So 2 to the x minus 1 in the, in the x value. 13. Okay, this one's obviously shifted down. We have a new asymptote at negative 2. So this is 2 to the x, whole thing minus 2. So d, I think it was. And then finally, that one's shifted up. We have a new asymptote at 2. So this is 2 to the x plus 2. How'd those go? Okay. How are you feeling about graphing in general? Like, could I put one up here uh, that you would feel like either of those? If I stuck that one, are you confident at graphing a base 5 and then a translation to the left? How about base 5, negative x? What would that look like? That way, right? It's reflected over the y-axis. I'm going to give you a little bit more practice on this, but I do want to move on. So, sound good? Okay. So, the sheet I give you here in a little while will have more graphing, but more of what we're about to talk about, too. Which is modeling. Modeling, there we go. So, you'll want a notebook. And your notes. Oh, actually, I was going to ask you before we do that. Do you want some notes on graphing? Okay, let's do that. I put it on our sheet. I was hoping you would want that. But... This is kind of an overview, but I think it will be helpful. So, you guys, this is, like I said, it's not, 
it's typically true. You might have some slight variation on this. Step one, you want to determine, well, you guys tell me, what do you think you should look at first? Before you even put pencil to paper, what should you know? Think of the ones you've done. Yeah, good job. You want to know if it's growth or decay? How? It, look at B. If B is greater than 1, it's growth, and less than 1, it's decay. Good? All right? Next, what would you do? Okay, uh, yeah, I would, I guess for a point, I would probably determine the y-intercept next. How? Yeah. Set x to 0 and solve for y. Alright, so that gives us a point that kind of gives us it's kind of a starting point, at least it gives us an easy point to find, but also it has a, it's a point of comparison to the parent function too. All right, I'd probably do the asymptote next, which is where? Is that the horizontal line y equals what? y equals k. So I would draw that in. Next. Determine any transformations. Um, for a, for a that's not 1, Just use a brief table. What are some good numbers to pick? Choose x values mindfully. What are good ones? Probably. Maybe not every time. But what x values would you plug in? Just to get yourself a couple points. One. I definitely would do one. Just low number. Probably one, two, three. Okay. Up here under growth or decay, maybe add this phrase. This gives you the shape. So you know if it's growing or decaying. And then just consider, this is not required, but it's super helpful to graph the parent first. We've done that on every one of these, where we've graphed the parent first and then moved it around. Okay. Do you feel like that'll be helpful? At least somewhat. switch over. Okay. Guys, this is where we get to switch, not switch, kind of transition into more real world kind of applied problems. So this one says the population of a large city is 4.6 million in 2010 and it's growing at a rate of 1.3 percent so this is a pretty typical sounding problem it could be 
Maybe it's instead of people in a city, maybe it's bacteria in a culture, maybe it's um, population of deer in a forest, I don't know. Okay? Lots of things can grow. Our goal today is to be able to take a statement like that, write a function rule, and then use that function rule to solve for various, you know, maybe it says three years from now, or five years ago, that kind of stuff, okay? So be able to solve using the function that we actually wrote. So this is good, this is real world math. And the reason I say that is we could probably look up, and I probably will, I'm going to look it up, hopefully I can find it, is what I mean. Um, a growth rate for our city, for Grand Junction. And then we'll be able to take that, make a, an equation, and predict the population next year or the year after. Okay? Now, lots of factors go into the growth rates, but uh, it would be a, an approximation anyway. So you can see this would be like the first question, what is an exponential function or equation that models the population, um, not asking to solve just once an equation. So to start off, this whole, pretty much the rest of this unit is going to depend on percentages. So let's say I have this number, and I want you to tell me what the decimal form is. Don't shout it out. Just raise your hand when you know. So what is that percentage as a decimal, a raw decimal? So I have two of you. Let's get some more. Three, good, keep going. In other words, I'm asking how do you switch between decimal and percent? That's what we're going to talk about for a minute or two. Okay, I'll put it up here and let's see if it surprises you. That would be the decimal version of this percentage. Okay, how many of you knew that? Did anybody get it right? Good, okay, let's go the other way. Let's say I have this percent. Actually, I'm not going to put a that's a number, and I want that as a percentage. So raise your hand when you can tell me that. That's just a raw number. I want to make it a percent. Good. A couple of you. Okay. So as a percent is that. 10,700%. So what do you notice is going on? Like in both cases, what did we do to switch? Yeah. Good. Moved the decimal point two places. Huh? Oh, it's, I didn't. I did it twice. I only wrote I wrote it wrong. I meant to write four zeros. Yeah, that makes more sense now. Yeah. I just left. I didn't get cash. Okay, so move it twice. If we're going from a percent to a decimal, move it left. And then to a percent, we move it right. That's really what it comes down to. And the reason you need to know that is because we're going to be converting back and forth. And it's, it will become just a small little piece of the problem that we do. So we want to make sure this is solid. Okay, and let's put a little reminder in your notes about it. However, with that said, guys, this can't be something that you have to look up every time. Okay, it's, it would be like looking up how to tie your shoe every morning before school. It's just cumbersome. So, please get this in your head. It's just a necessary life skill. Honestly, to be able to switch back and forth. <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. So if we have a decimal and we're going 2%, which way do we move it? To the right.
right? So decimal 2%, move it to the right. Two places. How would you use this in your real life, like today? Yeah, that's kind of the other way, but yeah. Tipping. What's a typical tip rate? 20%. 15, not 10. 30. <laughs> yeah, 15 to 20 is typical. 30 would be if you really like the service. Should you ever tip less, though? Probably not. Unless they were just completely rude to you, which most people are. <clears throat> Alright, how about percent to decimal? Everything is the same, except for we're going left. Okay. Huh? Have you seen like everything has a tip now? Like what? Like literally everything. Oh. So like, do you believe in that? No. Exactly. It's your job. Why do you need to be tipped for your job? Yeah, I I feel like there are certain industries where you expect to tip, mm -hmm. but you shouldn't tip everything. Like a restaurant. Yeah, like a server, a hair cutter. Exactly. Like Maybe a masseuse, like, masseur, yeah. Masseur, yeah. Masseur. But like, Starbucks, that's more tip. Like, like, literally anywhere. Oh. No. Isn't that true? That's free. $200 I'm not tipping your brother, Charlie. <laughs> well, it's like, it's all the tips, all of them go to like, like collected and they're distributed to all of them. Wow. So it's like, when you want to finish. But it's mm -hmm. just like, yeah, so only certain things have tips. I agree. Not everything needs to be I totally agree. Cause like, I, mean, I agree, but I'm not going to complain because I work at the front desk and do it. So guys, with that percentage, let's go back to this problem. And I'm going to work through how we're going to do this problem, and then we'll go take notes on the process. But it's kind of... It's kind of weird to write the notes without seeing an anchor for it. So, this population started at 4.6 million. That's our start value. So think of it, if this is linear, it's not, but if this was a line, this is like, if this was a linear relationship, that would be like B for, us, for that, okay? Again, it's not linear, but it's still going to go in our function rule somewhere. I'm going to tell you right now, it's A. So where does A go in our equation, in, into our exponential equation? Please don't sit there. Where does A go in our equation? Yeah, like, Arturo went like this, like it's at the front, yeah. right? So it's going to, our starting value for this is going in the front. Okay? The 2010 is only important when we start asking population questions after we have this equation. So we don't need it for this, okay? It grew at a rate of 1.3%. That's important. But it's not exactly how it goes into our equation. So first thing I'm going to tell you is I want you to use in-context variables. So P for population. And if it was me, I'd be writing this down. And then I would use T for time. This is population as a function of time. Is it wrong to use f and x? No, but it doesn't tell you anything either, right? So you have no clue what your function is actually about. So population as a function of time. All right, we know our start value has to go first. So I'm going to write 4.6 there. It does say 4.6 million. So if you wanted, you could put 4. Don't write this, I'm just showing you. You could write it like that, which is okay. Or we can just say that it's in millions at the end, okay? And then any numbers that we generate from this equation, we'll know we have to say million afterwards. Either way, I'm okay. Okay, so 4.6, this is our starting value. And remember, it's A. Okay, then from here we need our base. So if you're, if you're just thinking of the or excuse me, the exponential function 
a b to the x. We have a, now we need b. And then x in this case needs to be a t, since we have defined that to be time instead of some random x variable. Well, the big deal with these is what goes in here. So let me ask you this. <clears throat> At the top of this page of notes, we wrote about growth and decay. Growth, it said B has to be bigger than 1. Decay, B has to be less than 1, between 0 and 1. Okay? So if I go write our rate in here, 0 0.013, what kind of function is that? That's decay. It's going down, okay? So we are not wanting a decay function. It tells us it's growing. So what am I going to do to fix that? Because obviously I need the, the percentage somehow in there, but also we need to make sure it's growing. So we're going to say 1 plus 0 0.013. Now why would the 1 be in there? What is it going to do? What does it account for? Let me ask you that. It's really important that you understand this because it's going to be in all of these and we need to know why. <clears throat> and it's not just because it's supposed to be growth so we need to make it that way. It actually represents something. So that one is there to account for the previous year's population, okay? So it's saying take the previous year, one whole of it, like 100% of it, plus the growth, okay? So this is the previous value, um, let's say it accounts for previous value. And then this one represents the growth. In other words, if I just did the 0 0.013, I'm only representing how much it grew by and not counting for the last year. Therefore, it's not actually growing, but shrinking. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is our function rule for this scenario. Population is a function of time, starting with 4.6, and then uh, growing by that growth factor is what we're going to call it. So if we clean this up, here's what it would look like. And then yeah, you do need to say the in millions for this one. Okay? So just add those together. <clears throat> if I ask you what is the population in 2013, what would you do to solve for that? If I said what is the population in 2013? So the rate doesn't change, it's still growing, right? So this part, yep, yeah, this part stays. So we would put a 3 here for T, because it's 3 years since 2010. And then you just, we do need calculators for that, so you'll punch it in your calculator, and then 4.6 times this to the T gives you your population in 2013. Make sense? I thought we were talking about the previous year. Previous to what? How we would find like the population the year before. Oh, I got you. Okay. Guys, that's how the writing process will look, and then uh, plugging in a value for your variable for answering questions. Now, what if I plug in a value over here? Like, what if I want to know when it will be 10 million? So I would plug 10 here. How do we solve? for a variable in the exponent. Like think back to last chapter. Again, don't write this, I'm just thinking through with you. If we had a variable in the denominator, or in the base, I mean, t to the third equals 10, how did we get rid of that? What, did, what was our, yeah, cube root, right? So cube root and cube root, and then we just had t. Okay, so that was all fine, because we knew what the exponent was. Let's simplify this case. If it's 3 to the 10, or to the t, excuse me, how do you get that thing out of there? 
because we can't t root something. That's what we'd like to do, but we don't know what t is. So how do we get that out? Well, that's what a log is. Remember I, we wrote on our thing logarithm? That's what that does, is get that out of the exponent so that we can solve. It's the inverse operation. Okay, we're not going to do that today, but no, it's coming. So let's go write some very, very important notes. Some of the most important for the unit coming up right now. So we, we talked through just now factors versus rates. In this case, it was a growth factor versus a growth rate. <clears throat> so for growth, actually, yeah, let's just do it this way. So for growth, the rate is the percent. I want you to circle percent because I want this to stand out. Like I said, this is some of the most important notes in the whole unit. <clears throat> the percent of increase each cycle. Cycle, I'm saying it that way because like in this one it was per year, but we might be looking, or not might, we will be looking at what if your money is growing per month, per week, per day, per second, per instant, per constant. Okay, so your percentage is that rate of increase. <clears throat> That's different than the factor. Um, before the factor, let's write the word growth. Growth factor is take, it's, it's what we did with the one plus. So we can say that add 1, so it's 1 plus the rate. This needs to be as a decimal, though. Okay, so our factor is when it says 1 plus. The rate is just the part that we added to 1. Never put a percentage by itself. Don't put, like, in this example, 1.3 was our percentage. Never put that in here. It always needs to be as a decimal. Okay? Use this as B in the growth equation. the growth equation after we do both of these. So just know that that's B. Okay, let's do DK. If this is for growth, what do you suppose we do if it's decaying? Like, what if that population was shrinking by 1.3%? Yeah, just subtract. You got it. So the rate, again, it's the percent. <clears throat> the factor, like you guys said. <clears throat> Subtract from 1. So don't say subtract 1, but we subtract our rate from 1. 
Okay, so our factor now is 1 minus the rate, again as a decimal, and again use as b if decreasing. What's a good scenario in life that's decreasing that we've talked about? Car values would be good, yep. If you took a medicine, it's probably decreasing at an exponential rate in most cases. Well, about which part? Well, let's say you take Tylenol for a headache. So your body is metabolizing it. So the concentration in your blood is decreasing. And probably we could use a decay, exponential decay to model the concentration over time. So like initially you start with some, a typical dose of Tylenol is a thousand milligrams. So you start with that, it's probably going to fall off pretty quickly, but then maintain some kind of a lower concentration over time until it would eventually go to zero, right? But you'd have a pretty pretty high fall off initially as your body processes it. Same with alcohol, like um, I might have you guys do a problem where you're solving for the blood alcohol concentration after a certain number of drinks. It's exponential. Huh? <laughs> what do you say? Do we get it on ourselves? Oh my gosh. This is in a lab. <laughs> We are in a lab. I know, but this isn't an experiment. Because that's bad for you, that's why. Also, you're too young on top of it. It's for school. It's illegal. But alcohol is bad for you. I'm not going to advocate drinking it at all. Okay, so quick summary of that stuff. This is a template, or these are templates. So growth, and for money, we're gonna, we're actually gonna take what we're writing right now and amp it up a little bit for specifically uh, compound interest, but it will be based off of this. So for growth, I'll just use G to represent growth, G of X. Like we just saw, it could be P of T, or it could be like maybe bacteria, V of T or something. Okay, and then A, 1 plus r to the x. And I'll write a little description down below. So just write these first. And then for decay. And again, this is just like a template. It's general. Maybe I'll even write that word. General form. We we'll use d. And then A1 minus R to the X. Down below, let's define our variables. A is the start value. R is rate as a decimal. And then use in context variables as a recommendation. It's not a requirement, I just think it's helpful.
Everybody good? Alright, so I want to test your understanding of this idea of factor versus rate. So you don't need to write these unless you want to. Um, we're going to go kind of quickly. So I want to know what the factor is. So in here, what would I write? Don't shout it out. Just raise your hand and you can tell me. Whatever scenario, okay? I don't want you to worry about the scenario. Just what, what am I going to put in my equation as B? What is the factor? Oh, I wrote factor percent. I meant to write factor question mark. There we go. What's the growth factor? Good. I have one, two, three, four. Five. Okay. What is it? I don't think that's what you said. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. 1.04. Good. Okay, let's do another one. factor goes in there. Go ahead. All right, so take it in pieces. What is this as a decimal? Zero, zero, seven, five. Then what do we do with that for a declining or decreasing? Yep, yeah, so probably you want to use a calculator or write it out. Where's my calculator? Hmm, it's not working. 0 0.0075. 9925. Okay, that's what we would want in there. I'm okay if you want to write the intermediate step. That's totally fine. Put it 1 minus whatever your rate is as a decimal, and then you can combine it when you're done. Okay, let's try another version. This time I want the rate. So let's say I give you an equation with, uh, with the factor shown, and in this case let's say it's 1.035. What is the rate? Guys, questions like this would, would be like, hey, what did that guy earn on his bank account if this was the equation, right? What is his interest rate? Or, hey, what's the growth rate of that population in Denver if, if I have the equation for it? Okay, so this one should be 3.5%. How? Well, I guess the process, if you want to think of it that way, is take off the 1%. And you'll get 0 0.035 and then convert to a percent. So this is why we wrote it both ways <clears throat> on our notes. Okay, let's say we have this one. What's the rate?
So take that away from 1, that'll give you the difference between it and 1. And what is that? Point 1, 0, 1. Yeah. Oh, oh, one. I'm going to do it because I don't want to screw it up. One, one, one. See, I told you. Okay, and then convert that to a percent, which is 11.1%. But it's declining. You don't need to put the negative, uh, but it is a decrease, right? Or a decay. That's a decay. So, how are you feeling about that stuff? My suggestion would be to go tonight, the next few nights maybe, this growth factor, decay factor versus rate, you got to get that in. It has to be locked in because that's where students mess up. Um, I don't know if it's worth like boxing in this whole thing, but probably. Let's try writing and solving an equation, and then see if we have time to... Probably won't have time to work on a problem. I don't want to do that one just yet. And... Not that one either. Let's save those for the next day. So how about try this one? Let's make up one. What's your dream car, somebody? First one to say it. Oh, geez, okay. Look it up really quick. How much does it cost? 325 Okay, we'll just go with that. Dang, that's expensive. Driving around in a house. <laughs> Maybe not a Colorado house. But what? Okay. So the word for when we have an asset, this is called an asset. It's something you own that has value. It's called an asset. Um, and then, I didn't spell that right. The word in finance, I think I mentioned this yesterday, uh, for losing value is to depreciate. Depreciate. Yeah. Uh, somebody have their phone handy? Look up a typical car value depreciation rate because I don't know it off the top of my head. Is it like yeah. Well, I would assume it's fairly similar to regular vehicles, but maybe not. 9.63%. Per? Probably per year. Okay. What was it? 9. Okay. Alright, so two, two jobs. Actually, I'm just going to write it this way. How much is it worth in 2030? And let's say you bought it this year. Okay. So depreciating is getting, losing the value? Yep. Give that one a shot. So our, our um, sorry, our function rule, I'm going to use V for value as a function of time, starting with 325, 1 minus 0 0.0963 to the T. So to answer the question in 2030, that's six years later. So... I'm not going to write equals, sorry. In six years. Where do we stick that six? Yeah. Does anybody, can someone tell me this number? In here? No. Okay. Yeah, I just plug it straight in my calculator. Yeah, I was going to do that too. You can just plug it in your calculator with it like that. Zero 
Okay. And then what was the answer? Right. Well, you uh, said uh, one hundred seventy-seven thousand twenty-two dollars and seventy-three cents. Ooh, look at that, man. That sucks. <laughs> Damn. 